Greetings again. I want to clarify something here. Why is it that the Bible says, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified? And it's not of works, lest anyone should boast, as everyone in the mantra in the professed church knows. Well, number one, because by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified, because the law can't purify the heart. Because what constitutes righteousness in the Bible? The righteousness of God is revealed from what? Not law to law, from faith to faith. So what constitutes righteousness? Sincerity, purity, and love. It's faithfulness and fidelity to God's commands. That's what believe means. That's the reason it was changed from ritual in tradition, days and moons and Sabbaths, in sacrificial system, to faithfulness, sincerity, purity, and love out of the fidelity of a person's heart towards God, to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The moral imperative of the law is not chucked out the window by saying it's not of works, least anyone should boast, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. That's the lie that the evangelical church has fallen under since the last 500 years since the Reformation. And they've chucked out the moral imperative of the law and now instead of faithfulness to God's commands, we have lawlessness in our midst. And people just appearing to traditions, going to church, doing the good works at the church, although it's all filthy rags, thinking that is what constitutes them believing and trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Well, see, it's what constitutes righteousness is what purifies the heart. So what you need to do is ask yourself this simple question. To what advantage has any of your beliefs, your rituals, your practices, your ceremonies, all the things that you hold dear against the indulgences of the flesh? Why is this such an important issue? Because if you live according to the flesh, meaning given over to the passions and, and desires, your own self-indulgences, you will die and you will not inherit eternal life by committing the sins listed in the scriptures to say, let no one deceive you. If you do these things, you won't inherit eternal life. That's the simple reason. Because circumcision in rituals, traditions, will not purify the heart. And neither will a sacrificial system that was made for unintentional sins. And that's what it was made for. Even the Day of Atonement was for unintentional sins. Because why? Well, because willful, deliberate, and presumptuous sins brought death. The wages of sin is death. It's the gift of God that's mercy and forgiveness and remission of past sins committed on the condition of faithfulness and fidelity towards God beginning in repentance proven by deeds. And what? The passions and the self-indulgences crucified in Christ. That's how you enter his rest. Not by the keeping of any of these rituals and traditions or, or anything or any rite of circumcision. These are all substitutes for crucifying the flesh with its passions and desires and living a life of faithfulness to the moral imperative of God to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbor as yourself. Then you won't steal, kill, lie, cheat, commit adultery, perversions, and all the rest of it if your heart is purified by that kind of faith. That's the bottom line here. So you never cease from striving and from diligence, endurance. You're never resting in the finished work of Christ here. No, you enter his rest diligently, like it says. Let us therefore be diligent to enter his rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience, Hebrews 4.11. See, so you never cease from your striving, but no longer striving to keep a circumcisional right, a custom, a tradition, a law, a Sabbath, a new moon, dietary laws, or all the rest of it. Because why? They have no advantage against the indulgence of the flesh. Here it is, Scripture. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 22. Let no one judge you in food or drink regarding a festival, a new moon, or Sabbath. There, were, there was more than one Sabbath. Which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is Christ. Okay, these things were a shadow. 
They wouldn't purify the heart. They wouldn't take away sin. They had to be done again and again and again, just like the book of Hebrews teaches. Let no one cheat you out of your reward, taking delight in false humility, the worship of angels, intruding into these things which they have not seen, vainly puffed up in their own fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head from whom the body is nourished and knit together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles or the rudimentary principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to these regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Which concerning things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and the doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, in false humility and neglect of the body, but they are of no value against the indulgences of the flesh. That's why you got all these people, whether they're following the Torah, whether they're following the lawlessness in the church, thinking that the finished work of Christ has got them covered, all the vileness and lawlessness. That's the reason. Because the flesh has never been crucified in the process of repentance. That's the parts that's left out by almost all the street preachers we hear. All the chat rooms and the blogs, everywhere we go, that's what we see. So these people that are crying, the substitute for obedience, whether it's in the form of he did it all and you're saved and born in sin and saved in sin and the magic cover, or whether it's in the form of traditions and Sabbaths that you think you have to adhere to to win favor with God, all based on what? On circumcision. Circumcision, that's what Paul's talking about in the scriptures when he talks about the law. The circumcision. See, your circumcision would be credited as nothing if you don't what? If you're not faithful to God in sincerity, purity, and love. But if you are, then your uncircumcision will be considered circumcision, like in uh, the Romans chapter 2 scripture. See, he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and in the circumcision is that is of the heart. Applied what? Without hands. Without the rituals and the commandments and traditions of men. That's what matters here. Not to rely on some substitute for crucifying the flesh and end up still in bondage to your double-mindedness, your sinful indulgences, the wretched man, the chief of sinners, the wicked heart, the filthy rags religion. Offering up your filthy rags all day long in in sending anybody else to hell that says they're walking in the righteousness of faith and keeping the moral imperative of the law. So the scripture says these things are of no value against the indulgences of the flesh. Because what? They do not emphasize the moral imperative of faithfulness to God by doing what is right. So remaining in bondage to these weak and beggarly elements, as it's called in Galatians 4, 9 through 10, leaves you in bondage to the observances of days and new moons and all the rest of it. Until you've crucified that flesh with its passions and desires, entered into what righteousness consists of. Righteousness of God is revealed from faithfulness to faithfulness to fidelity to obedience. I mean, you could translate it that way in Romans 1.17. Because that's what faith and believe means. That's how righteousness is revealed, doing what is right by faith. The law fulfilled in the heart. It says in Romans 3.31, well, we abolish the law by faith? No, we uphold and establish it. Not the circumcision of the law, the rituals and traditions. We uphold the moral imperative of the law which is the moral imperative of faithfulness to God, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbor as yourself. Didn't Moses say that in Deuteronomy? So the imperative was always the same. These things were types and shadows leading to Christ, the substance which is in Christ, to enter into that Sabbath rest, if you want to call it that, striving diligently in the Spirit, walking in purity of heart, in victory over sin, the flesh, and the devil. That's what makes the difference. Not applying these things by proxy or substitution that has been done for you. That's what constitutes lawlessness in the church. 
The purpose of the commandment, sincerity, purity, and love in 1 Timothy 1.5, I keep repeating. That can only be achieved then when the self-indulgence, passions, and desires of the flesh are crucified in repentance, and then you're raised to newness of life, the old man put to death once and for all, not to be repeated. You don't repent for the rest of your life. You don't sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, confess. No, these things are done once and for all. That's, that's the text reads in Romans and in Galatians. And you walk in the Spirit and you do not fulfill the former desires of the flesh to return again to that bondage because you're a slave to whom you obey. You want to obey these things? Well, then fine. You're a slave to whom you obey. But do they purify your heart? That's the key. From what I've seen, no, they don't. See, any attempt that you try to rule over the indulgences of the heart, of the, of the flesh, before you've put to death the deeds of the body in repentance, is going to fail. And you're never going to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust by substituting your first requirement of coming clean with God in repentance. And all the liars are out there telling you you can't come clean because you're born in sin, you got a sin nature, you can't help what you are, so you're a work in progress and God's going to help you. And all those lies that you've been told for so long that y'all people are all clinging to, but then you remain in bondage, double-minded, the wretched man. And most of you end up in despair. See, there's no real assurance in doing these things. Because why? They're done in the flesh. That's why. They're not done in the rest. See what he's talking about in that Hebrews passage. See, brethren, beware. Back in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in you, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, or disobedience is the same word, departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, this double-mindedness, this sin confess, this you're going to always sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. That's what it means entering into Christ. Any attempt to substitute that is going to end in failure, in misery, because you're never going to enter into the true rest of Christ where you're striving in the Spirit with all diligence and purity. See, period of heart is essential to faithfulness to God. You can't be faithful to God while you're still double-minded. The double-minded man receives nothing from God. He's unstable in all his ways. What's he say in James chapter 4? It purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cleanse yourself of all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Those things are imperative into entering into Christ. So that's ceasing from your lab outward labors to be holy or try to win points with God through rituals and keeping days and uh, dietary laws and even circumcision some people are insisting upon. But to be act actually diligent and holy and striving, walking in the Spirit 24-7, free from the bondage of sin, putting on the new man which was courted, created according to God in righteousness and in true holiness. That's what the scripture says. Put to death the deeds of the body, which are, we got in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, which are fornication, uncleanness, lust, perversions, drunkenness, all those things put to death once and for all, not for the rest of your life. If you do those things, if you continue to do those things, you've never entered into Christ to begin with, and you're not going to inherit the kingdom. You're saying that God can't rule over those things? You're saying that the victory that's in Christ is not victory over the sin, the flesh, and the devil? That sin is more powerful than the Holy Spirit? That's what it seems to me that a lot of people are saying. So again, we never stop striving. Just like that Hebrews 4.11 verse I read a little while ago. Again, it says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. See, the rest in him is guarding our hearts against sin, the deceitfulness of sin. It's deceitfulness that leads you into fornication and adultery and struggling with drunkenness and perversions where you think you're converted, but you're not. That's deceitfulness of sin. 
those kind of things leading you away from God, not towards God. See, we rest by adding to our faith. We add to our faith virtue, to knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, those things. We must add those things to our faith or you will fall back into your old ways. Then the entrance is supplied to you into the everlasting kingdom of God. When you add to your faith, when you work out your salvation, when you work together with God, you put on the whole armor of God, you fight the good fight, you take up your cross, you strive. That's what it means to be in Christ. Not to sit, kick back and relax and be addicted to sports idolatry and entertainment idolatry and all the other stuff so many of these professed Christians have posted all over their websites. See, in the professing Christian world of lawlessness, they're never going to find this rest because they're always striving in their flesh to defeat the flesh. And it's not going to work. The carnal man has enmity against God. He's never become the spiritual man through a, rep a, a genuine repentance. See, they never honestly stop to ask themselves what constitutes true faithfulness to God. To them, it's the finished work of Christ. It's the magic transfer. It's the proxy cover that the, the payment in advance brings and all that nonsense. Or it's the keeping of Sabbath and rituals and all the other things where these people remain in bondage and have no real assurance that they have confidence towards God. That's the sad part of this, I find. They're striving about all these things. What should we do or not do of the 600 and some laws? There, which ones should we keep? Which ones can we keep? They're striving in the flesh. Just like the lawlessness that's going on inside the church. And so, you, you know, you want to bring somebody out of the church system because of the lawlessness, then you bring them into confusion of circumcision. That's why he says, circumcision or uncircumcision availeth nothing but a new creation in Christ. Or circumcision availeth nothing but keeping the commandments of God. What are the commandments? The moral imperative of God. To love God, to love your neighbor, it's yourself. So you don't violate the moral imperative of the basic law of Moses. Not the rituals, not the dietary laws, not the days and the customs. The fullness is in Christ. See, many people look at us as second-class Christians for refuting these traditions. But really, like I've been trying to allude to you, who is unclean here? You say, do not touch, do not handle, do not touch, don't touch, don't do this, like it says in that, in that Colossians verse. It says, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. But what's it say about Christ? In 2 Corinthians, where he's quoting the Old Testament, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, taken from Isaiah 52, he says, do not touch what is unclean or defiled, come out from among them, and I will receive you as my sons and daughters. What's he talking about? Unclean. To put to death the deeds of your body. Crucify the flesh once and for all. Then you'll be received. That's what's unclean. And the teachings that are unclean. That lead to double-minded, wretched man lawlessness. That's what he's talking about here. See, you stay in Christ not by mixing truth with error and darkness with light and evil with good and bad fruit and good fruit and mess up and, and sin confess. No. No, you do this by walking in sincerity, purity, and love. You do not dilute the life-giving wine with the water of the teachings of men. Water it down, so to speak, with the gospel message that the world's preaching, which ends up in pollutions of the mind, soul, and spirit. See, what they did was, what did they do? He talks about in Hebrews 3 and 4. They hardened their hearts against the voice of reason, rejecting the true Sabbath rest, the freedom from the bondage and corruption of sin that they were striving in, in favor of what? The traditions that went all the way up to the Pharisees in the arguing about all the stuff that was in the Talmud that was added, added to the law of Moses. And what happened? The people were in bondage. To their, sin, to their sins instead of being cleansed. They were dead men's bones. They were full of right, 
unrighteousness and deceitfulness. What is, what is this people outside the system and inside the system, what have they done? They've traded it in favor of the sin nature gospel that you never cease from sinning. You're born in sin, you're saved in sin, you just sin less. You're always seeking absolution then in your rituals. A laborious task of sin confess, sin confess, always double-minded, always saying, well, I'm struggling with this and I'm struggling with that. And then when somebody tries to tell you about this, righteousness and purity that they're walking in, you say, you don't sin? You use the same argument against them that the heathens use out in the street where you go preach to them. Well, how can you preach when you're committing the same sins that you're telling them to repent of? You're disqualified already. If you're still in adultery, unfornication, and drunkenness, you say you're struggling with those things. And to me, that means you're still willfully committing them. That's not a slip-up, a mistake. That's a willful sin. A deliberate and mindful thing that you conceived in your mind that it took you bondage and you became sinful like James chapter 1 talks about. Drawn away when you're enticed by your own desires. Your own, your own lusts. So as the double-minded wretched man, you have nothing to offer these people but the same thing you have. That's what's hardening your hearts against the voice of reason is. Trading the real gospel for the sin nature gospel to sin constantly, never have any victory over the sin, the flesh, and the devil, but nothing but defeat and more defeat, and you try to search the scriptures night and day to prove that you can be saved in your sins. And then everybody's a wretched sinner, like 1 John 1.8. If I say I have no sin, I lie and there's no truth in me. The mantra of almost everybody on the lips, just like the, the accusation, do you sin? Meaning, well, you don't commit adultery and you don't get drunk, you don't fornicate. That's what they mean. They're not talking about mistakes or unintentional things. They're talking about the vile sins they're committing that they want you to drag you down to their level and admit that you're in the same boat they are. But see, that's the defeat that comes about in this gospel of alternatives in a system where there's no righteousness, there's only double-mindedness and being spotted by the world. They've adopted a system in which they've never truly cleansed, been cleansed of all unrighteousness by the blood of Christ, their past sins, been purified in heart by faithfulness, and substitute that to perform rituals of all sorts to carry on this constant cleansing they think has taken place in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, through confessions, and then the moral imperative of faith, faithfulness to God, goes by the wayside. See, but yet that's what supersedes the law of Moses in the ritualistic circumcision of Moses in the righteousness that's written upon the heart, not in stone, like Romans 13.10 says. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law, just like Matthew 22 where he talked about the greatest commandment. Don't you see that that's what purifies the heart? And that's what's happening with these people? It's the heart that has to be circumcised by faithfulness to God through repentance. Like Colossians 2.17 says, a circumcision made without hands to move, remove the body of flesh, the, the sinful desires, to put on the new man that's created in righteousness and true holiness. The flesh profits nothing without faithfulness to God. We can't serve God in our mortal body until we've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, the self-indulgence. Galatians 2.20, the life I live in the flesh, in my mortal body, I live by faith in Him. And through Him, I've crucified that flesh, that, that self-indulgence, and walk in that faith. So that's what it means to enter into that righteousness to cling to him, to be purged and purified by a genuine repentance proven by deeds and find a place of rest instead of this carnal, worldly self-indulgence of this double-mindedness. You've got to be renewed in the spirit to make a righteous judgment between darkness and light, evil and good, in those that serve God and those who do not, like it talks about in the last chapter of Malachi. Otherwise, you're going to be judging everybody by these rudimentary principles 
man-made religion and ordinances and all this substitution and magic cover stuff. That's why you've got to point the finger at everybody. They're all sinning all the time like you. That's why you've got to do that. You're forced to do that because you're believing that your method is a cut above all the rest because you're telling them they've got to stop sinning, but yet you haven't stopped sinning. So you're going to bring them into your Bible study and tell them how to cope with your sin? Wouldn't that the same thing promise keepers are doing, all, the, all those reprobate people that are raking in millions? Yes, it's the same thing. See, the defilement of the flesh has got to be removed. You don't serve God as the filthy rags, wretched man. You serve him acceptably with reverence and godly fear, the scripture says. But most professed Christians have chosen that above. The perfect man under the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ. See, because they don't think there's a perfect man, that means you're perfect as God. If you stop all these things that it says in the scriptures you must stop, well then you're being perfect as God, and nobody's perfect as God. See, it goes on and on with the excuses. Those are all lies. None of it's based on scripture. Only in your imaginations is it based on scripture. So all of this is in vain without purpose and to no value. You think you've received the grace of God, but you've received it in vain because it's without purpose because it hasn't purified, the faith, faithfulness hasn't purified your heart and grace hasn't empowered you to live a godly life in this present age because you're still struggling with all this double-minded nonsense and the doctrines and the traditions of men. So you're going to be in bondage to these useless creeds and these doctrines, these false hopes, these magic covers, all these substitutes while a great salvation awaits you. If you flee your Babylonian captivity and take the first step of faithfulness and fidelity towards God in repentance to crucify your self-indulgence and walk uprightly in the Lord with the passions crucified, put to death the deeds of the body. Therefore we must give a more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. Don't let anybody deceive you. It's going to be judged according to your deeds. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which was first to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will? As Hebrews chapter 2 to first four verses. See, but it's not a salvation in sin, under bondage to circumcision, to rituals, or to magic covers and proxy substitutes. No, it's a salvation from the corrupting influence of sin and the corrupting nature of sin. Once and for all, done in repentance. If you will put forth the first effort God requires to enter into that rest and then remain on that narrow path to eternal life. That's the imperative of faithfulness versus lawlessness. And I see all these people in bondage under all these traditions that have no value against the indulgences of the flesh. None. So they argue against purity of heart righteousness of life, argue in favor of sin, and then deny it out of the other side of their mouth at the same time they're, they're arguing in favor of it. And we hear it over and over again. You sin? You perfect? You never sinned? See, the point is faithfulness, not sin. The point is to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires and to walk in purity, surety, and love towards God. That's the point of the gospel, or you're not going to inherit the kingdom. It's in your hands to enter in to his rest today.